Remain standing as we read God's word together. That one's one of my favorites, by the way. Though we read, we sang the updated version. We didn't sing here, I raise my Ebenezer. I don't know if you guys knew that or not, but anyway. Um, one of my favorites. We are in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, and we are looking at verses 3 through 12. Matthew chapter 3, verses 3 through 12. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea, and all the district around the Jordan. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray for eyes of faith as we look upon your word and that your Holy Spirit preaches to all of our hearts here today. May us be edified and renewed as we worship you through your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It would, you may be seated, sorry. Nah, I think today you guys will stand through this one. Huh. What's that? Yeah. It would seem that if you asked around and you looked around, everyone has an opinion on who Jesus is and what he would do. I'm never surprised when a non-believer makes a statement like that, followed by an incomplete and an absolutely inaccurate depiction of who Jesus is. That's not surprising to me at all. And you spend any time on social media, you will see it. Jesus would have never done that, Jesus would have never said this, and so on and so forth. Today it's often stated with such arrogance, though, where the non-believer in times past was more open to correction. They, uh, when, When they had a faulty or inaccurate view, you can come and say, well, you know, that's not correct what you were saying, can I show you? And oftentimes they were at least open to listening, but today it is uh, an inaccurate depiction or statement stated with such arrogance. Even though there is an arrogant attitude about who Jesus is, it does not surprise me when they follow it up with something false. I'm not surprised when something like that comes from non-believers. What does surprise me and what does drive me nuts is when these same exact things that are being said by non-believers are being repeated by people who teach from the pulpit. And I am seeing it from them. As a matter of fact, I'm hearing it more and more, and I am witnessing it more and more. This year alone, I believe, has exposed the true colors of so many people, of so many ministers. It is apparent to me that the secular culture has a grip on the church, and the church is bowing down to what the secular culture wants to do. It is apparent to me that the secular culture has the power over the church, and the church is in a very dark place right now. This week alone, I was contacted by Operation Save America, which is what I shared with you guys um, uh, when I was giving you guys announcements. And it's a ministry that is dedicated to the abolition of abortion. They found our ministry through the, some of the connections I've made and, uh, at G3, at the G, when I was at the G3 conference and uh, contacted my cell phone uh, directly when I handed out my cell phone number to some of the people there. And they are looking for this ven- a venue in Sioux Falls because they're having difficulty trying to find somebody who's willing to host them to have this seminar uh, on abortion. Uh, the seminar is called Church Arise. 
I told him I would be more than happy to help, and I sought out to call Baptist Ministries first, and then after I contacted Baptist Ministries, I went to other denominations that had a sanctuary that can host 200 people or more. And so far, and I have a few more to call, but so far, every single one has turned us away. Every single one has turned it down. I received a lot of, you know, this whole uh, COVID-19 thing has put a damper on us right now. It's put a damper on us meeting. And I say, oh, you guys are currently not meeting at the moment. And then there's a pause. And then I hear, no, no, we're meeting. We just can't host you. Okay, have a nice day. COVID-19 makes for a solid excuse as long as there's no follow-up question. One well-known pastor with a very large ministry in Sioux Falls, uh, one pastor I honestly was depending on the most and was surprised by, and I did not expect this from him, he said, boy, you are getting pretty political there, aren't you? No, sir, just biblical. It's been quite the eye-opener. It's been quite the eye-opener for me that the church is not concerned with righteousness, with faithfulness, with integrity, and not concerned with any form of obedience. The church has become scared of what people may think of them. And it wasn't just one ministry. It's an eye-opener to the spiritual reality of Sioux Falls. It's because we've spent so many years cultivating an environment that's not biblical. And I've been preaching about it for so long. These are all the things that I've been speaking about. When we spent our time in Romans, I've talked about it quite a bit. That's the fruit of what I've been talking about, what we are seeing. It began when we sacrificed our worship services to be more inviting and to be more enticing. What we do right here is we expound on the Word of God. That's what the pulpit ministry is. We do not mess around with cultural enticements. The pulpit ministry is the ministry where we expound on the word of God. We make God's word known. It is the center point of it all. From the pulpit, God's word must be proclaimed. We are proclaiming the word of God from the pulpit. The sad reality is, is that there are so many who do not know the difference. They do not know the difference between a word-focused worship versus a topical uplifting message. The difference between preaching the whole counsel of God and trying to be a weekly therapist. We have made the center of our worship man-based and not God-based, and we never recognized it. Because the man-centeredness that is, that is dominating ministries throughout the United States is masked and cloaked with religious language. So we miss it. We go, man, that was an uplifting message. That was good. I needed to hear that, but nothing was really said at all. And because this is the environment that has been created, it's no wonder that when something like COVID-19 hits, we have ministers repeating the same thing that the secular Darwinian world is saying. And so we are being told that it's unloving for God's people to gather together. That it's unloving for God's people to gather together. That is what we're being told. That loving our neighbor means that when a pandemic hits... When something contagious is around, we must love our neighbor and do the right thing and isolate ourselves and isolate ourselves from each other. My guess is, is they got that, they drew that from Jesus' attitude with the lepers. Remember how Jesus isolated himself from the lepers? He stayed away. Remember how he instructed his disciples to stay away from the lepers? Never happened, did it? And this year has created a whole slew of dialogue of Jesus would have done this and Jesus would have done that and he would have said this and he would have said that. Or Jesus would have never done anything like this and he would have never said anything like that. 
I seen one post on social media that stated, I find it odd that Christians use sheep as an insult. Also, Christians insulting. While I agree, I too find it odd that Christians use the word sheep as an insult. It seems like an odd word for Christians to use that as an insult. Does not mean Christianity has to be void of insults altogether. We are told that the gospel is foolish to those who are perishing, that we are a rock of offense, that our very existence is offensive to those who are perishing. And so we are the rock of offense to those who are perishing. We don't even have to say anything. People will find us offensive no matter what. Part of the reason why we're going through the Gospel of Matthew is so that we can paint the best picture that we can of Jesus through Matthew's words. And it's not the same picture that the culture is depicting. We have a very, in our culture, a very 1960s hippie rendition of Jesus. We have all the pictures of him. You guys had it in your homes. You've had it in your Bibles. It's this Jesus with the nice L'Oreal washed hair, and he's so clean, and, and, and uh, he, he's a registered Republican, by the way. And, uh, um, and, and, and he, that's just our vision of, of, of who Jesus is, and he would never, ever insult anyone, and he would never be bold, and he would never be aggressive. Read the Gospels again. Read them again. So we want to go through this gospel so we can forsake our own presuppositions for a moment and see who our Lord is and how he interacts with people because it's important that we see that. Because how the world describes our Lord and how the Bible describes our Lord are two very different things and we have to know the difference. So let's dive in and let's look at today's word. We have a lot to cover today. So if I'm moving too fast, I do apologize. Look at verse 3. For this is the one referred, by, referred to by Isaiah, the prophet, when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now last week, we introduced John the Baptist. And we had a focus on a message of repentance and on the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. This is a theme that will continue throughout this chapter, and it's going to go into the next chapter. Uh, it's, it's, it's a theme throughout this gospel, as a matter of fact. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is this present reality when we look at Matthew's gospel. We will ultimately see this explained by our Lord when he uses the signs as the evidence of the kingdom was present. They asked about the kingdom, and he said, You've seen it. Look at the signs. They point to it. So we have our introduction of John the Baptist and the message he came saying, which is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, Matthew gives us this detail that John himself was referred to in the Old Testament. Uh, other gospels tell us the same thing. And so he tells us it, it was Isaiah that foretold of this. And, and you can find this in Isaiah uh, chapter 40, verse 3. Uh, Mark and Luke also testify of uh, John the Baptist being foretold about, but they give a little bit more detail. He was the one that was foretold. Uh, he's, this is another example of God's sovereignty, that if God is not sovereign, we cannot have prophecies. We have no reason to trust in prophecies if God is not sovereign. That God himself is in control, and we must find our comfort in God's ability to have control. And so what was foretold about John? That he is this voice, the one crying from the wilderness. Last week we talked about the theme of the wilderness, how it's always from the wilderness God will make his nation, that from the wilderness he will do something great. It is a very eschatological um, a word for the Jewish people. It, was, it, it had so much end time meaning for the Jewish person. It's a theme that's going to continue in this chapter and into the next chapter as we see Jesus tempted in the wilderness. And it's important. It's important to know because mankind's story didn't start in the wilderness. It started in a garden. It started in a garden where man and his bride were not hungry, but they had plenty. And it was lush and it was beautiful. 
And now man, mankind is in the wilderness, the ruins that Adam and Eve created, the very ruins that they started. All of creation groans and all of creation has felt the sting and effects of sin and death. And so the ruins that Adam created is the same ruins that Jesus gets tempted in. The wilderness that Adam created is the wilderness that John is proclaiming his message out from this wilderness, this very wilderness that was created by the fall. This very wilderness that was created by the sinfulness of man, this very wilderness that was created through man's rebellion, this voice cries out. Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now this was something that was normal in ancient culture when it comes to royalty. And it's fitting that Matthew used this language right here, right now, because he just talked about the kingdom. And I have no doubt that that was his intent, to use this royal language when he just got done talking about the kingdom of heaven. But in ancient culture, you always prepared the path for the king when they traveled. You always prepared the path. You made straight out the road. You flattened the road. You made sure that the road was a safe place to travel and that you were making it, you were preparing the, tr the, the, the course. And that's what John the Baptist is doing. So one would go out before the king of kings. He will go out and make prepare the journey for the king make it the most efficient it is so fitting of a picture of john the baptist he is there to prepare the hearts of the one who is to come the stronger one the mightier one the one who will bring this new baptism and so in just one verse we get the idea of sovereignty and we get this idea of kingdom and we get this glimpse of john's role and i have to just point out in passing that this is what I mean to you when I said, when I struggled with the idea of the sovereignty of God, I began to see it on every single page, just about every single verse. It's unavoidable. It's there all the time. And this is just another one of those examples. And so here's the foretold one, being faithful to the mission that he has been entrusted with, being faithful with the message that he has been entrusted with. Now here's the description of John. Look at verse 4. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. John has an appearance of ruggedness. It is an appearance that fits the message that, that John brings. His message is a message of ruggedness, of roughness. That is the type of preaching that John does. So his physical uh, image fits his preaching image very, very close together. John holds back no punches. He was a firm evangelist. It's also exactly how Elijah is described, by the way. And we find out later that John the Baptist came in the spirit and likeness of Elijah. This is from the words of our Lord. This is something that Jesus revealed. The Jewish people are waiting for the coming of Elijah, and Jesus said, he came. You missed him, and then you killed him. He came. By the way, the Jewish people are still waiting for Elijah. And during Passover, they still leave an empty seat. They're waiting for the return of Elijah. And John, uh, Jesus testified that Elijah came in John the Baptist, saying that he was in the likeness of Elijah. But not only in looks, but in message and in the same spirit of power as well. Elijah described as a man with a hair cloak and a leather belt around his waist. And here we read of John having camel hair, having a camel hair cloak and, and a leather belt around his, his waist. Camel hair was very coarse, very coarse, and it's probably very cheap garment. It was fitting attire considering the lifestyle that John the Baptist had living in the wilderness. And then we get to look at John's diet, and he eats locusts and wild honey. We know locusts as grasshoppers. That's what locusts are, grasshoppers. Some are aware of that, some are not. But this is what John the Baptist is eating. He's eating grasshoppers. I had a neighbor who used to do that, by the way. He enjoyed them very much with chocolate. Also ants. We are told that he, that he eats them with wild honey. This means this is honey that he went and actually gathered himself from a, from a wild beehive. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, 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 farmed bees or anything like that. It was a wild beehive, and that's how he gathered everything. He lived off the land. It was based off the stuff he found, and it was a diet that was very common for a Nazarene. 
Locusts are permittable to eat under the Jewish law. They're the only insect that are permittable to eat in Jewish law. And there's still some places in the Middle East and different parts of the world where they gladly eat this stuff, and it is a great treasure and joy to eat grasshoppers. This is all meant to give you the image of who John the Baptist is while he is this bold and fierce preacher. He's also a very humble person. To Jesus, he was the greatest prophet to have ever lived up until that point in time. But he is someone I am more than certain would have, would have and would be rejected in our current church age if he was a preacher in our current churches. If a man with a leather belt and camel hair who was known for eating grasshoppers was a preacher, I don't know if he's going to have a large following. A lot of churches would not let somebody like that step into their pulpit. I don't think many within the pews would just sit and listen to a man who looked like that. But his passion and his fierce preaching was drawing a crowd. Even though he looked the way he looked, it was drawing a crowd. Even though he lived the way he lived, it was drawing a crowd. And we not only learn about the large crowds um, towards John the Baptist from the Bible, Josephus speaks about this as well, that, that this John the Baptist had a very large following. And so there are other historical accounts that, att that testify of John the Baptist. And so here's this humble person who doesn't have the fine clothing, who doesn't have the fine diet, and he doesn't really have a place to call his own. And what do we read about him next? Look at verses 5 and 6. Then Jerusalem was going out to him, and all of Judea, and all the district around the Jordan. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. Matthew lists the towns and regions where the people are coming from. He just says, you know, Jerusalem's coming, all Judea's coming, the district of the Jordan. They're all coming down to witness this one man. Who may be, in their mind, the first prophet to speak in 400 years. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now, this baptism should not be confused uh, or viewed as equivalent to Christian baptism. There was no Christian baptism during this time. Matthew does not make the distinction uh, right now, but he will make the distinction later on in this gospel that there are two distinct baptisms. And the distinction that Jesus gives us is the command to go and baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That was marking a difference in baptism, but we're not certain how different they are. This baptism that Jesus commands was after the victory of the cross. It was after the resurrection. It was not instituted before that point. And so we can't say this is Christian baptism because this is taking place before that point. And so we cannot understand these baptisms as the same. However, it is difficult to figure out exactly what this baptism is that, that John the Baptist is doing. It could be related to the Jewish rite of purification, but some have argued that it's can't, can't be compared. It's not the same. The Jewish rite of purification, they would do several times a day and throughout the whole day. Every time they got dirty, every time they touched something wrong, they had to go through the washing again, the spiritual washing all over again. And they would have to do it with their feet because they walked all the time. And so they would go through the spiritual washing again. And it was always the ceremonial religious manner. There was a form of purification where it was very similar to baptism as we know it so far uh, as the physical method goes. It was reserved for Gentiles, though. It was only when Gentiles wanted to become uh, God-fearers, as they were called, and be recognized by the Jewish people as God-fearers. The Jewish leaders would, in a sense, baptize these Gentiles to purify them and bring them into their fold, and they would, be, they would receive the label as God-fearers. Some historians take issue with that being the same thing that John the Baptist is doing here because they will argue that the practice that was used, it was not used on Jews, and here John the Baptist is doing it to Jews. But that fact may further testify to John the Baptist using this and, and, and the reason why he's preaching repentance. It's kind of actually fitting because he's preaching repentance to the Jews. That's something that's also kind of foreign in this, in this time and day and age. They took comfort in being the descendants of Abraham, and here comes this prophet preaching repentance. And so they do kind of go hand in hand, and it's kind of fitting that, that here comes this one who's making way, the, the, the path, making straight the path, and he's saying, here is what you need. You need this repentance. You are falling short. 
You are not who you think you are, and we got to be purified. we got to be ready because here's the one that is coming. The pur- purification rite that was offered to Gentiles is being offered to Jews as well. The exact reason why John the Baptist is baptizing the way he does is not specifically known because we do not have these things preserved in history. Not fully. So there's still a lot of mystery in in the baptism of repentance that John the Baptist is giving. We do know it is a baptism of repentance, though, and that it is a symbol, as John will make clear, that it's just merely an outward expression, but then there's one who will come and he will do more than just this outward expression. But we have to recognize the word baptize here. The word baptize means immerse. And believe it or not, it's actually a violent word. It's actually a violent word. And so the word was often used in times of warfare and conquer. The Roman soldiers, when they went to go siege a city, and it was described, they baptized the city, they flooded the city, they immersed themselves in the city. It was used in a violent way. Also, water was a sign in Judaism, it was a sign of death. In this day, the Jewish people did not like large bodies of water. They were terrified of it, especially the ocean. To them, it was, it was a symbol of death. It was a symbol of despair and doom. This is why when the storm came over a lake, remember this, folks, they were on a lake. It's called the Sea of Galilee, but it's a lake. They're on a lake, and a storm comes, and they are terrified. You, you, you can swim that lake. And they were absolutely terrified because the idea of water, this body of water, was a symbol of death. And so what are represented is, is, is violence. It's representing death. And when it comes to Christian baptism, it represents the grave. It's just the same word. It has this hint of violence. We are being buried in the likeness of Jesus, raised in his newness. Often we see, we see in art John the Baptist, he's in the, he's in the, he's in the Jordan, and he has, he's cupping the water with his hands, and he's pouring it over the people's heads, and that's what we see in artwork. And honestly, when you consider the word baptism, when you consider the Jordan, I, and consider the language used here, I'm not convinced that's how he baptized was through the, 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 the pouring or sprinkling of water. When Jesus was baptized, he was brought up and out of the water. When the Ethiopian eunuch was baptized, he was brought up and out of the water. And the Jordan River is a very large body of water. It was a large river where boats can go down. Very, very large body. It was not a little river like we see in art depictions. It was a, it's a very large body of water. Uh, To use such a large body of water just to sprinkle water really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. The sprinkling of water has historical value, though. Uh, It probably has more to do with uh, the church being limited in the midst of persecution. They were very limited on how they can do things, and they had to get creative in the midst of persecution. You couldn't just go and build baptistries wherever you wanted to go. And so you had to get creative, and I think that was their way of, 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 of baptizing in secret. It was like, okay, we're going to sprinkle, we're going to pour, and there's a historical tradition behind that. But, and we can't blame these people for getting creative in the midst of time when their lives are in danger uh, and trying to, get, trying to baptize in the most creative ways they possibly can. They were trying to protect themselves, and they were trying to protect others. Who can fault them for that? But it doesn't ignore the fact that there are ancient churches that have been discovered where there are full in-ground baptistries built. And if you're doing a means of sprinkling or pouring, a full-body baptistry makes zero sense. With that said, it's fitting with the word, and they probably dunked people more than they did with the sprinkling people if they did have the baptistry or a body of water present. But this is a conversation and a topic for another time. This is not the point of John's message. It's just that these words are here and we have to go through them. It is not the point of John's message. Um, The end of the gospel, we will get into that in more detail. Now, Matthew, look at verse uh, 7 through 10. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. 
And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. <clears throat> the Pharisees and the Sadducees were two groups that did not get along with each other at all. They did not like each other at all. The Sadducees were more of a political religious movement, and the Pharisees were more of a legalistic conservative movement. The Sadducees had the powerful friends, but the Pharisees had the power over the people. Made for an odd dynamic. Some historians take issue with the Pharisees and the Sadducees together like this in all the gospel narratives, especially in how they come together against Jesus. Uh, and they have an issue with this based on how much they actually disliked each other. They really did not like each other. They did not get along and they did not gather together. However, if you are both part of a religious system and suddenly there is word that there is this man who's Elijah-like and he may be the first prophet in 400 years, you're going to stop what you're doing and you're going to go and check it out, regardless of the animosity that's there. And so you're going to get down there and figure it out for yourself. You're going to wind up going, let's find out. We are the high and mighty religious elites. We'll know if this is a prophet or not, and we will go and check it out and let the people know. Now, regardless of the animosity, this is huge news. Here's a prophet speaking for the first time in 400 years. It's small in the comparison of a little animosity. And so what we are told is that they came for baptism. Now, when we consider all four Gospels, we see John was pestered a lot and questioned by the religious elites, by the religious leaders. It's this, just constantly, constantly being pestered, and that there's multiple events where they came and pestered him. And we're not sure which event this is, but as soon as John sees them, he says to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Ouch! Ouch! Guess what, folks? John just broke all the rules given in ministry today. All the solid ministry advice and training that's often give, he just broke all those rules. I don't remember a seminary class that taught me to name call. I never took that course. What we must understand, too, is that Jesus repeats the very same words. Our Lord says the exact same thing to the exact same people. To the religious leaders. You brood of vipers. He's calling them sons of serpents. That's what that means. Sons of serpents. Sons of snakes. Remember how I said people claim Jesus would never insult? And then he says, John says, who warned you to flee the wrath to come? Do you guys get what John is, is saying here? He's saying, this is not a message for you people. You religious elites who stand in these temples and stand in the synagogues, this is not a message for you. Who told you about this? This ain't about you. You are the issue. You are the problem. You are the sons of the serpent. Very foreign to our line of thinking today. Very foreign to our way of preaching today. But it is evident that John does not fully intend that they are not allowed to hear the message of repentance because he tells them to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. It could be that he's now no longer talking directly to the religious leaders at this point because it is clear at some point while he is talking, his dialogue, it, 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 its attention goes somewhere else. It's toward the people who were baptized, not towards the religious leaders. And that's apparent in the context because he talks about, I baptize with this water, but the one who come is going to baptize with, with, the Holy, uh, with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so it is evident that at some point in this conversation, his attention is directed towards those who are there to be baptized and who have been baptized. He rejected baptizing these religious leaders. They came for it, but he told them no. And so at some point in his preaching, he focused his attention off the religious leaders, and it's, it's to the, everyone who came to be baptized as a whole, just this whole group. And so here's the, the symbol and display. And so we're not certain exactly 
where he switches his attention at. It's just one of those things you kind of have to be there for. It's one of those things where it requires a physical context. You know when someone's speaking to you and when they're not speaking to you, and you can only have been, been there to know the exact context of it all. So it could be in this verse he's telling everybody, he's focusing his attention on those who are being baptized and not the religious leaders. Or it could be uh, later on, uh, but he could, be, he could be directing it towards the religious leaders. There's just no way of knowing for certain who he's directing this towards. He informs his list, listeners, do not take comfort in Abraham. Do not suppose this about yourself. Do not take this comfort that you are a descendant of Abraham. For I say to you that, those sto- that these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. And what a wonderful mention of the gospel. What a wonderful mention. How many times are we told that our heart of stone will be turned into a heart of flesh? And what what does the Baptist have to say here about stones? It's also a reminder of what we covered in Romans, the words that Paul had to say, that not all of Israel is of Israel, and not all the physical descendants of Abraham are the spiritual descendants of Abraham. And then we get a glimpse that it is God who is able to make one a child of Abraham. Did you guys catch that? That it is God who is able to do that. It's God who makes the descendants of Abraham. It is something that God does. How many times are we going to keep seeing this theme? Quite often. And he informs him that the axe is already at the root. And when something's at the root, it means taken out for good. Being removed for good. You're removing it for good. The axe is already at the roots. And any tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And this is in the context of wrath, the wrath that is to come, the wrath that he just mentioned. Those who do not bear the fruit of repentance will be cut down and thrown into the fire, an everlasting fire. John continues, look at verses 11 through 12. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. You see how the the narrative is towards the people now? I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now here we have a baptism distinction taking place. It's not a distinction between the Christian baptism as in the ordinance and John the Baptist's baptism uh, because he's not mentioning water baptism. He says baptism, baptized by the Holy Spirit. And that's not the same as Christian baptism when we are talking about the ordinance that we practice. Again, we are using a word that has a specific meaning, and that word baptized has a specific meaning, and that meaning is immersed. And so the one who is coming after John, who is mightier than John, and John recognizes that this is, the, this is, this is one who I, I'm not even worthy enough to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. And so the image is being immersed in the Holy Spirit. That's why that word is being used, being immersed in the Holy Spirit. And we are looking at an image of salvation that is not the ordinance of baptism. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is that we are immersed by the Holy Spirit and a purifying fire takes place within the heart of man. Something, we, we go through this purification process. That there is a purifying fire taking place within us, within us always to purify us of our wickedness and our vileness. You see, the same judgment that is reserved for the wicked is also used for the righteous. And I'm defining the righteous as those who have the Holy Spirit. A fire is still taking place, but the fire that is for the righteous is the purification from sin. It is to rid us of sin. And it's a process that is happening within you right now if you have Christ. It is just one is for the good of those who have been received and the other is the just and due punishment that we all deserve. He then provides this image of what is taking place. The grain worker would, be, uh, would use a winnowing fork and he will throw the grain in the air and, and the good grain is going to fall straight down on the, thresh, on the threshing floor and, and then the chaff will blow away in the wind. And so that's what they would do. They would do this 
to, uh, to get the good grain to fall on the threshing floor, and, and then the chaff would blow away, and then they would take that, uh, afterwards the worker will take that winnowing fork, and then he will um, clean up the whole threshing floor by gathering it all up and putting it into the barn, and then he would take all the chaff, and then he will burn it. And that is the image that John is providing for us that is taking place. He's saying, there is this one who is coming. And the one who is coming is going to separate the wheat from the chaff. That's what he's coming to do. He's coming to separate the wheat from the chaff. And that is what the worker does. He is the one who is working, and he is the one who is separating. Now, these are harsh words to preach. And it's the same exact words that our Lord repeats. These harsh words are not something that we need to get excited about. Some people do get excited about harsh words being preached. We should not celebrate preachers who are being harshness just for the sake of harshness. We should celebrate preachers that are preaching uh, the whole proclamation of truth, the whole counsel of God, regardless of what stares may come, regardless of what accusations may come, regardless of, uh, of whatever the culture might bring. We should celebrate those who, are, who care enough and are bold enough to proclaim truth. And there are preachers out there who are just vicious for the sake of vicious. They exist, and they're a dime a dozen. It has nothing to do with truth for them. It has everything to do with the type of environment that they are trying to create. And they are guilty of the same thing of what the modern church is doing. The modern church is trying to create an atmosphere of entertainment, and some people are entertained by a vicious preacher, and so they go there for entertainment. We should not celebrate these preachers. We need to celebrate the ones who preach the whole counsel of God, who are unashamed of the truth, and preach the whole truth. John here was not interested in entertaining any crowd, and neither was Jesus. He was not interested in entertaining any crowd. Matter of fact, he chased away more crowds than he gathered. The motive was to tell the truth and to penetrate the heart of wicked man. And there are some people who present their preaching style with no grace, no grace whatsoever in their preaching language. I wonder, though, how many preachers would have a job if they stepped in the pulpit and started calling important people brood of vipers. So while, though the modern churches are focusing on certain verses and and they say this is what Jesus would do and this is what he would never do and these are the things that that he would say and he would never say, we have to understand that, that faithful preachers and Jesus himself did in fact use insults and were very bold and very unapologetic about those things. It wasn't insult for the sake of insults. They had a purpose. But they were often used for those who were in positions of spiritual leadership. Who were not being faithful to what they have been entrusted with. The ones who have been entrusted with a mission and a message and were not being faithful to it. Those were the ones that received the harshest words. They were entrusted with the message, and then they departed from that message. It was an act of betrayal towards God. Do we get that? When we are entrusted with the mission and with the message, and we're not faithful with that, it is an act of betrayal towards God. And it's the same exact mistake that is being repeated. That the message that has been entrusted to us and the mission that has been entrusted to us has been changed. We've changed it. We have grown soft and given in to the whims of the culture. So much so that we can't even do acts of righteousness. Acts of righteousness no longer takes place. We do not want to act in obedience or in righteousness in fear of what image it may bring before the world. We're scared. We're scared of what other people might think of us. Well, folks, there have been times where I have preached on difficult subjects and I have watched some of your faces tweak and squirm. I've seen it. 
And when I see the faces adjust, there's always the temptation to back off. Always. I always feel the pressure. Do I need to soften this? Do I need to relax? The temptation is always there, but not once have I ever done it. I care too much about you. I care too much about you all to treat you like the Sadducees and Pharisees treated their own. There have been some sermons where some of you have admitted to me that it was difficult to sit through and that I gave a large pill to swallow. I do it because I care. It's not always the easiest. When I'm writing them, I'm thinking it's going to be easy, and then I see the faces respond, and it becomes difficult. So believe me when I say I have seen reaction to faces, and the temptation is there to kind of back off. I've seen people physically fidget in the pew. Some days when I'm preaching. And there have been times, not here, but there was one time... (laughs) Where I was preaching, and I'm seeing heads nodding like that, and I'm scanning the room, and I'm seeing heads nodding, and then I come across one person, and they're like, talk about a derailment. That could throw you off quick. I'm like, oh, yeah, everyone's liking this. Whoa, what's your issue? (laughs) What did I say that you didn't like? Just shaking no at me. I never found out why, though. So talk about something throwing you off when you're in the middle of a sermon, when you're in the middle of preaching. There has been a mission that has been entrusted to me, and there's been a message that has been entrusted to me, and that mission is that I must equip you all with the Word of God. That is my role here, is I must equip the saints with the Word of God. And so that you all can go out and be the light of the earth, the light and salt of the earth. And equipping you is not always an easy task. It's just not, because sometimes there's just some hard pills to swallow. Now, if the worst I have to face is judgment from some of you, then I got it good compared to what John the Baptist had. Because he was risking death. You were talking to the leaders of the culture, and eventually... They could come at you with blasphemy and boom, execution. Spoiler alert, that's what happened to our Lord. They still did it. At the risk of death, they used harsh words. And we were scared of saying certain things and doing certain things because people might give us some looks. Now, people may not like that, and our church won't grow. That's the common understanding. We got to be well liked. So we create worship services that are designed to entice unbelievers. Folks, this part of worship is not meant for unbelievers, it's meant for believers. We're glad and we rejoice when unbelievers come, but this cannot be designed for unbelievers. And we got it backwards. We got ministries that go, you know, I want to give uplifting sermons that are encouraging people, but not give them the real meat. If people want the meat, they need to come to Sunday school. That's where the real meat is delivered. No, that's backwards. We worship God through his word, so we proclaim his word. The word has to be the center of it all, and we've gotten away from that because we're afraid of the looks people might give us, and then we sit at home, and we have the guts, we have the nerve to say, what in the world is going on today? What happened? Why is the world falling apart? We have abandoned truth, and we are not properly worshiping God in our sanctuaries. We have exchanged bold men of God, bold preachers of God, for a weekly therapist. That's all we want, is a weekly free therapist. And that's what we have exchanged faithful preachers for. You and I do not have the time to waste time with messages that only make you feel good for a while, for a superficial, temporary message. We don't have the time for that. You and I do not have the time for me to give you the theological fuzzies. I don't want to do that. You should not want me to do that. Life is short, folks, and some of you know this 
more than the rest of us. Some of you have more years on me and you know more than I do and you're like, yes, the most important lesson of life is that life is short. So life is short, folks, and we need to make the best of our time and be the best that we can to be the salt and life, light, uh, the, the salt and light of the world. The best we can possibly be. And that salt and light doesn't happen by avoiding acts of righteousness, by avoiding the difficult subjects. What is going on in the world today? We have buried the gospel. We have buried the gospel and we are afraid of acts of righteousness. We are afraid of what the world might think of us and what the world might do to us. I will not live in fear. And perhaps you are sitting there thinking to yourself, I'm not afraid either. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of what anybody thinks of me. I've never been afraid of what anybody thought of me. And I'm not afraid of what anybody does to me. If that's true, where are you proclaiming these messages at? Where is your gospel proclamation to the culture? Where is your fearlessness and how is it displayed? Oh boy, is it time for us to begin praying that the Holy Spirit continue to purify our hearts with holy fire, burning that sin away that is within us. And commit ourselves to real acts of righteousness and real life-saving messages, not for the sake of being bold. We're not doing it for the sake of being bold or being aggressive or being conservative or whatever it may be or for the sake of saying, hey, I have a backbone, I have a spine. We do it for the sake of the kingdom. We do it for the sake of our own culture. We do it for the sake of, the, of our future, the future of our kids and our grandkids. Life is going to continue beyond us. How are we going to leave this world? What kind of world will we leave behind? It's time to stand up and stand firm. And the sad reality is, is I'm learning that we have so many churches not willing to do that. Absolutely unwilling. We can be possibly the first state to abolish abortion and churches do not want to get on board with that what message does that send what are we really doing how are we really being edifying our boldest statement we can make that we have been making in our culture is we say mary Christ miss. And then we think we've done our good deed. I, I don't say happy holidays. I say Christmas. That's our boldest message right now. Do you get how we sacrificed? Do you see it? Look at the message that John just gave versus the message we are giving in the public square, in the public eye. We need to stand up and stand firm. People's lives are depending on it. The lives of the unborn, the, the lives of those who are perishing. There are people who are full throttle on the way to hell and we act like we could care less. We won't even give the gospel to Democrats. Did you know that? We deem them unworthy of the gospel. We don't like to talk to them. We're not standing up and we're not standing firm. We're not doing it. We're not. And we have an entire culture refusing to do it right now. And so far is from what I can tell, there's one ministry in the area that is willing to even host an event and speak about these things. Just one. And that's us. 
I have not found any other pastor who is willing to come along, even alongside, to help. So far. I'm praying that changes tomorrow. We're losing, folks. We have been unfaithful. We are acting like the sons of serpents. And we must be in repentance for it. So let's stand up and stand firm. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful for today's message. The reminder that uh, your preachers have always been bold no matter what consequence they face. That your faithful ones have always been bold no matter what consequence they face. Oh, Father, there are so many who have gone before us who told the truth while looking death right in the eye. Father, I pray you give us that kind of faithfulness. I pray you give us that kind of eagerness as well, Lord. Forgive us of our transgressions. Forgive us for just being so lazy, Lord. Forgive us for just all, just all the ways we've been silent. Father, we have so much to ask for forgiveness for. Father, we pray for the repentance of your bride. That your church stand up and speak boldly once again. And we see a revival take place through the power of your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.